So yes, so like I was saying, this is a collaboration between myself and Claire Collin from Bristol Interaction Group and uh, Emanuele Maggioni and Mariana Obust um, from uh, Skylab at Sussex University. I, I do want to give just a brief background at the start to hopefully clarify some of the broader, broader motivations behind the work. Um, it comes under the umbrella of two projects. Uh, the critical project, uh, we're interested in exploring how we can apply principles of cross-modal perception to the design of technology uh, for children who are blind and sighted. And it's also part of the OWIDGET project, uh, in which uh, our colleagues in the University of Sussex are interested in exploring how the, we can bring the sense of smell as a, a significant uh, modality of interaction in HCI. Uh, so our joint focus essentially between technologies for children on the one hand uh, and our interest in multisensory and cross-modal interaction on the other hand sort of drives uh, the um, motivation behind this work. Anyway, before I go any further, uh, this is a large room, so I'd like to try something and invite you all to do a quick quiz, if that's okay. Um, uh, it's not too complicated, and please feel free to join in, even if you know what's coming up. So uh, it's quite simple. I'm going to introduce you to, the, to two friendly char characters. We have a jack shape, like a, a piece of shattered glass, and we have a rounded shape, like an ink blot. And I need your help, and I want to give them some names, like a pet names. Uh, if you were to give them pet names, what could these be? The catch is there's only two possible uh, uh, pet names to use, and that is Booba and Kiki. So here you go. I want to, everybody to repeat after me, Booba and Kiki. Ah, oh, come on. <laughs> Let's do it again. Booba and Kiki. Don't be shy. Come on. Nice. Wonderful. Okay, so next I will display one of the shapes, and your job is to shout which pet name you think it should have, Booba or Kiki, as soon as it appears on the screen. Are you ready? Yep. All right. So, Jack shape first. Okay. And next, the ink blot. Wonderful. All right. So, if you agree that this is Kiki and this is Booba, then you do belong to about 95 to 98 percent of the population who also think so. If you don't, then you're a bit of a rebel, and well, that's not a bad thing. Um, this is actually based on an experiment um, that was first introduced all the way back to 1929, has been replicated many times, including across cultures and across languages successfully, and I guess it was replicated just now in this room to some extent. Um, so at the core of this Buba Kiki paradigm is what we call cross-modal interaction. This is the idea that the um, information we receive from one sense can influence how we perceive and interpret information from another sense. So in the case of Buba Kiki, uh, uh, what uh, there's a seeming interaction between what we see and what we hear. So cross-modal correspondence then is the claim that there are non-arbitrary associations between sensory modalities. For example, the fact that there is a high percentage of agreement that Buba is Buba and Kiki is Kiki um, kind of suggests that there is a cross-modal correspondence between uh, the symbolism of the visual and auditory and linguistic features of the stimuli. Now, there's a lot of evidence coming to us mostly from experimental psychology pointing to this cross-modal correspondences and across a range of modalities, not just sound and, and visual. So we know that sounds modulates uh, uh, perception of ta uh, uh, vibration, tact vibra tactile feedback, that words modulate states, taste, and so on and so forth. And I guess this raises an interesting uh, design concern. So if modalities do interact, so they influence each other, um, as uh, the, uh, the evidence seems to suggest, then we and the HCI folks um, who are interested in introducing more and more modalities of the user interface, we ought to A, understand what these interactions are, and B, take them into considerations when we design interactive technologies. And there has been some interest in doing just that, so taking cross-modal correspondences and looking at how, for example, it can improve interaction in VR, it can improve the design of sensory substitution devices for vision-impaired people, or it can improve uh, engagement with mobile games. But we do found that, uh, as with many things, there is a bias towards sight, uh, touch, and hearing uh, in, in HCI in general, so we know m much less about the so-called chemical senses, taste and smell, so we, we don't know much about the cross-modal correspondences with these with these uh, sensory modalities. So in this work, what we want to do is pay attention to smell, uh, to bring the nose back into the picture, as it were, right? Um, so what we do in the paper, we start from the Buba Kiki experiment, the, the Buba Kiki paradigm, um, and we try to explore uh, whether or not it transfers from the uh, visual linguistic correspondences to the tactile and olfactory uh, correspondences. In other words, are there correspondences between feeling and smelling those shapes? 
And uh, uh, we also pay attention, or we're interested in the place that emotion plays within, within, within these uh, correspondences, if, if any, uh, just because uh, the senses of touch and smell tend to be tightly linked uh, to emotions. So in the uh, rest of the talk, I'm going to tell you about an experiment that we did to explore this question, uh, some uh, results, and end with some reflections of the implications of our findings. So the main question uh, that we wanted to explore in the uh, experiment is um, whether there are cross-modal correspondences between smell, touch in 3D shapes, and emotions uh, that are present independently of vision. So we needed an olfactory stimuli, and we uh, used lemon and vanilla because these have been shown to have correspondences with the visual booba kiki shape that you saw earlier. And then we needed uh, 3D uh, uh, tactile stimuli, so we 3D printed Buba and Kiki. If you can see them, they look like this in my hand, so they fit nicely on my palm, and I can kind of close my, almost more or less, my fist on them. And we recruited 14 uh, sighted uh, child participants for this study. Recall that this is part of an umbrella project that's interested in designing technologies for children, um, which is why we have children participants. Uh, and actually, we extended the sample size to 20 since we published the paper. Uh, because uh, although the work published here is done and it's, uh, uh, and it's finished in, in and of itself, it's like I said, it's part of a larger ongoing uh, research that are three, five years long. So we wanted to just use this opportunity to um, share additional data that actually just reinforces the findings that are already published uh, in the paper. Uh, so our participants were, uh, like I said, uh, so in this case 20, we had 12 uh, female, average age of 13, recruited from a local school. Uh, they had healthy sense of smell, no allergies, and they were around 13 years old, um, like I said. So we asked them to do two tasks, a, uh, uh, a smell-shape association task and a smell-shape emotion association task, and then we interviewed them to ask about their association strategies, if any. So for the smell-shape association task, we use this uh, uh, apparatus, which I'll describe. So we have two opaque boxes that we place on the right and left-hand side of the participant. We would put, uh, oops, we would put a shape in each, inside each box so they can't see it. So, for example, Booba on the left, Kiki on the right. And then we would ask them to press a physical button uh, situated in front of them. When they do that, there is a nozzle about 45 centimeters away from them that would display a puff of scented air. And then we ask them to place their hands inside the boxes to feel the shapes and decide which shape they would associate with the smell that they just smelled. And then we ask them to indicate their choice by uh, moving this tangible seven-point Likert scale, which is just a ruler that we 3D printed. So in addition to Buba and Kiki, we used the cylinder shape uh, as a neutral control shape, and we used air as a neutral uh, smell. And then for the um, uh, second task, so the smell shape emotion task. Uh, we use a slightly different setup. So here we just use one opaque box. We ask them to place their dominant hand in it, where we place either booba or kiki. And then we hand them a jar that has either lemon or vanilla uh, smell. And then uh, we ask them to feel the shape and smell the scent at the same time. As they do that, we administer uh, a questionnaire to, um, uh, about emotional association. So here we use the modified version of the self-assessment uh, mannequin questionnaire. And we modified it so that it's on a three-point uh, uh, Likert scale uh, on uh, the dimensions of uh, balance, so positive emotions, happy, sad, or neither, uh, activation, uh, so arousing emotions, and uh, confidence emotions. I have some audio, but I'm not sure whether it's going to work. The other modification is that we administered this through sound. So we played an audio recording of these questions. Happy, yeah. sad, neither. Calm, excited, neither. Confident, uncertain, neither. So I guess the audio does work. Um, right, so on to some uh, results. Uh, I won't uh, cover everything. Uh, as usual, please consult the paper for more details and insights. So recall that we uh, measured smell shape association using a seven point Likert scale. Uh, uh, we found that there's a, there is a tendency to associate Kiki with lemon and Booba with vanilla, so as we expected, and there's no clear association for the cylinder shape. Uh, and this, with the extended sample, was uh, statistically significant, again, for Booba and, and, and uh, lemon, uh, sorry, for Kiki and lemon, and for Booba and air, in this case, with a tendency that's not significant for Booba and vanilla, and again, an ambiguous re uh, result for the uh, cylinder shape. What's interesting to note here is that um, 
when asked, not all participants picked out all the three smells. So we didn't tell them what the smells were during the experiments. And for some, it was mainly just one smell along a spectrum of intensity. So for example, just lemon, very strong lemon, medium lemon, weak lemon. And this, uh, we thought, might explain some of the results we have uh, found, especially with the booba in the air. But what was, what's most important here uh, in our view is that this results uh, confirm that the booba kiki the paradigm can be transferred uh, from the visual linguistic correspondence to 3D tactile on olfactory stimulation, which is an original contribution. For the second task, uh, the smell, shape, emotion association, recall that we were measuring this on a, a, a three-point uh, three Likert scale of modified um, self-assessment mannequin. So we found a significant difference for the arousing emotions only, not the other emotions, so we'll only talk about that. And in particular, between the combinations of kiki and lemon and booba and vanilla. Uh, and, and this was, uh, again, strengthened with the, with the, with the additional, um, uh, uh, additional sample. Um, but again, what's, the, what's interesting here to reflect on is that um, uh, it's like what um, the data reflects that there is basically uh, the, the choice of emotions was sometimes driven by the shape and other times driven by the, uh, by the, by the smell. So we can see, for example, that uh, uh, with Kiki, even with vanilla, uh, it would still uh, induce a significantly high arousal emotion. Uh, and Booba, even with lemon, would still induce a significantly weaker sense of arousal. So in simpler terms, if you were to summarize this, participants tended to associate uh, the combination of sharp, pointy objects and lemon smell with a sense of excitement, and the combination of rounded uh, shapes and the smell of vanilla with uh, calming emotions, and there was ambiguity around the cylinder shape and the other smells. So, um, uh, and we feel that this, this provides evidence that uh, uh, not only did we extend the Booba Kiki paradigm from uh, uh, or, or the audiovisual to the tactile and olfactory, but also to the realm of emotions. And uh, in this case, also participants were able to integrate uh, smell uh, and touch and activation independently of the visual and, and sound symbolism in this case. So finally, we conducted a thematic analysis on the interview transcripts. Uh, so this is where we're trying to gauge what were the association strategies that the participants had for making the associations, if any. Um, for the first task, interestingly, it was, uh, there was no clear, we couldn't find any clear strategies, basically. The participants were uh, finding it difficult to articulate the strategy for why they would associate a particular smell with a particular shape. Uh, though it's important to note here that this is not the same as random association. Uh, it's, it's rather a problem of articulation. So, for example, they would say something like, this smell is definitely the shape. I'm just not sure why uh, that is the case. But they were much more articulate with the smell, shape, emotion association strategies, and we identified four distinct strategies. So there were strategies based on, based on the sense of pleasantness. So they might like the smell or like the sensation of a particular shape, and they would associate that with a positive emotion. Uh, there were strategies related to uh, personal connections. So in one instance, for example, one participant, uh, for them, the smell of vanilla reminded them of the room where their grandmother passed away. So they would associate this with, um, with um, uh, sadness or uncertainty. There were strategies related to locations, either imagined or real. So a smell reminds me of walking down the forest, for example. And then finally, there were uh, strategies um, uh, what we call uh, related to geom geometric features. So the association to emotions were specifically done in relationship to uh, features of the shape. So for example, uh, Kiki is spiky and eccentric and that's exciting. Uh, Booba is nice and smooth and that, and that is calm. The cylinder is closed and it's on itself, so that's kind of uncertain. So again, I think it's interesting to note here that there are uh, times where it is the smell that dominates the choice of association, as we can see with some of the strategies, like with the location or the sense of pleasantness, whereas with other strategies, like the geometric features, it is the shape that drives the, uh, the and dominates the association strategy. And these are quite revealing because they confirm the complexity of articulating and expressing olfactory experiences. Uh, so participants had to, in order to label sense, had to resort to uh, 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 using attributes from other sensory modalities. Uh, and there was one quote that nicely kind of captured this. One participant said, uh, I quote, if I was to describe something that smells, I can only say whether it's uh, nice or bad, like popcorn. You know, I know what the smell of popcorn is, but I can't really describe it to you. It's just a nice smell. 
So I want to end with uh, just some reflections on the implications of these findings. Just to quickly summarize, we found that there is a tendency to associate spiky shapes with lemon, rounded shapes with vanilla, and that the combination of spikes and uh, lemon tend to induce a sense of excitement. The combination of roundness and vanilla tend to induce a sense of uh, calmness. So what? So we think there's both theoretical and practical implications uh, to these findings. So like I said, in, in theoretical terms, we were able to systematically demonstrate that the Buba Kiki paradigm could be extended uh, and to the realm of 3D uh, tactile experience, to olfactory experience, and, the, and to the realm of emotions. And this opens up um, uh, the space for new opportunities for further systematic studies of cross-modal perception and interaction in HCI and beyond. Uh, so, for example, we could, this could help with identifying properties that could be used to classify shapes and stimuli. Uh, and it could also identify when and how emotion should be considered as uh, essential or as secondary uh, to the contributor to the cross-modal uh, shape-smell correspondence. Now, in practical terms, uh, we also think that this, ha this, has, uh, this kind of opens up spaces for uh, uh, thinking about more rich, rich and, well, richer and more inclusive sensory uh, multi-sensory interactive experiences. Um, so we could, for example, envision, can we augment, for example, the tangible bits with multi-sensory feedback so that you have, you can use smell and form to um, uh, uh, convey how we interact with emotional content. Or maybe you have a shape change in mouse that kind of morphs into a kiki shape uh, as soon as you get a notification with some kind of distressing content. Or maybe it just morphs into booba if that's a nice content. Or the computer detects that you're stressed and wants to calm you down a little bit. Um, in our own work, we're interested in applying these findings to the um, area of designing inclusive education technologies. So one example we talk about in the paper is the collaborative storytelling for visually impaired and sighted kids. And we are at the moment in the process, thank you, in the process of running co-design workshops with visually impaired and sighted um, uh, children. We, provided, we provide them with multi-sensory uh, crafts, including all these boobas and kikis and scents, and we can observe how they co-create together and make sense of, uh, of stories. So for instance, they could use a combination of kiki and lemon uh, uh, as a means of, or a symbol to express the onset of an exciting scene in the story. Uh, so this will help inform the design of um, means, more inclusive means for expressing oneself, but for also creating common ground between uh, people with different visual abilities. So in terms of future work, we just uh, finally note that the experimental method that we uh, develop and use could be administered eyes free. So this includes validating the use of a tangible Likert scale uh, for, for the smell shape association and of an auditory uh, modified version of the self-assessment mannequin. So this accessible method constitutes another contribution of the work and it will allow us to um, replicate the study uh, with visually impaired children, which we are doing at the moment. So to summarize, in this paper, we explored the cross-modal Buba Kiki paradigm, and we showed in a systematic fashion that it can be extended to 3D tactile experience and olfactory experiences, also to uh, uh, express emotional content. And we believe that these findings open the space for exploring richer multi and more meaningful multisensory experiences in HCI and for the systematic study of, of, of multisensory and cross-modal interaction uh, in this place. And uh, uh, we believe that it does have a wide range of applications. One of particular interest to us is uh, the area of accessibility and inclusion for people with different sensory uh, impairments and sensory abilities. So with that, I thank you. And if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Hi, roll vertigo. Um, <clears throat> sorry, my, my voice is going a little bit. Um, so you said you extended the data set. I didn't quite get that. Did you did you recruit extra participants, or what happened? Yeah, so there are ongoing studies. Uh, so we're doing a bunch of studies that looks at um, smells and tactile and actual visuals stuff. Right. So um, we had additional participants that do this. Uh, this so stuff. when you ran the first statistical test on the first, say, how many subjects? Sorry, say that again? The first test on the first set of subjects. How many subjects 14 did you have? subjects. 14. Yeah. And then the second test, how many subjects did you have? So uh, in the paper, we report uh, results for 14 participants for both tasks. But you uh, said you added subjects, right? You had extra data, So uh, right? we've, uh, I've showed in the presentation uh, data from both 14 participants for task one and 20 participants for task one. Right. So, so did you reuse the data from the first 14 participants? Or did you rerun the entire experiment with another 20? No, we, we rerun the analysis, basically. Yeah, you can't do that. Because then you're, you're doing the statistical test twice, 
on the same data. So you're running the you're running the dice. You're rolling the dice twice. So now your p-value has become 10%, not 5%. Right. So my my the reason I ask this question is because I have a serious problem with kind of the generic conclusions that you draw on the basis of something that seems barely significant. Plus, you only have two choices. Like, it becomes really interesting if you can define a shape language where you can go from Booba to Kiki, but you only have two choices and you only have two smells. Mm -hmm. And you're simply asking people to choose between the two. And yes, there appears to be maybe something there, but that's the level at which I would make the generalization is like there this is interesting there's there's room for further work but mm. i wouldn't just go blank out and say like this is a new sort of like design strategy i think that's too far-fetched yeah based on this this mythological issue right i think well i think i would uh, disagree a little bit it's interesting to look at the um uh, extending the range of shapes like you described so going say from from uh from a spectrum from booba to kiki and see how uh, the complexity of the shape morphing that influences the, the the choice of the smells but i guess you have to start somewhere and in this case uh, because this is novel in the sense of looking at um, taking this paradigm and applying it to a new set of sensory modalities we went with this basic choices in the um workshops that i'm talking about and in actually in further works as well we actually use exactly what, you, what you're describing this idea of a range uh, of shapes and um, because that introduces a level of complexity even in, in terms of expression and one of the um, interesting things that came up in this study is that people find it difficult to talk about uh, sensory experiences that are not you know what typical so visual or sound so in this case we're actually using this uh, this stimuli to uh, um, study how people actually engage with each other reach consensus around making sense of, of uh, olfactory and, uh, um, and tactile experiences okay, thank you